So again, for those of you who've just joined us in the last couple of minutes, um, you're joining us as guests of Bodega Bay Sur in partnership with Sonoma Fire Safe Council. That's the Sonoma County Fire Safe Council who has helped us out in numerous ways, mostly by sharing this information and volunteering Mason, our moderator, to join us tonight. So on behalf of the board of Bodega Bay CERT, of which I'm honored to be a director, we want to welcome everybody. And uh, we'll say this a couple more times as people join us. We'll wait a few more minutes, but you will all be muted. And we will stop a couple of times during the presentation. You'll see a, a cute little prompt slide that'll let you know that we're going to have a quick break. And that's when you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question live. But throughout the presentation, you can type your question into the chat. Everybody will see it. And periodically, Mason will monitor those questions. And when we take breaks, he will ask them and I'll do my best to answer. Mason, thank you for uh, sharing that information about the Grizzly Corps and your Grizzly Corps Fellowship, because one of the things tonight is all about is helping the whole community and how to volunteer if you're so inclined. And so AmeriCorps is an enormous program. I'm fortunate to be part of several nonprofits who have uh, taken advantage of AmeriCorps and been blessed with amazing AmeriCorps volunteers. But Mason, you're my first Grizzly Corps, Corpsman, Corps Fellow. I'm honored. Hopefully, you know, not the last as the yeah, Grizzly Corps that continues great. to expand. Yeah. Yeah. I told Mason earlier, I just, I just get a kick out of saying Grizzly, Grizzly Corps. <laughs> I actually thought in the beginning that that was a program of the U.S. Forest Service and they were channeling Smokey, but I didn't go to Cal, so... <laughs> it took me it took me a few days to to figure that one out so not a us forest service grizzly a cal bear grizzly so let's see it is um 604 a few minutes after 6 why don't we you know wait another minute or two what are we at since i can't see everybody 604 604 no in terms of participants oh we're oh we're at 50 okay. yeah Okay. Well, I think we'll wait wait a couple more minutes. And um, again, for those of you who have just chimed in, you're joining the Bodega Bay CERT quarterly community safety meeting. And I'm Julie Atwood. I'm a board member of Bodega Bay CERT, and I'm also the founder and director of the Halter Project. So we're excited to be here tonight. We're really excited that we have people joining us from all over. Of course, we wish that you could all be with us in beautiful Bodega Bay, which is really uh, the community that's at the heart of our Southern Sonoma Coast. Uh, one of the, uh, I think it is the longest county coastline in the United States. And we have just loads and loads of iconic, fabulous locations for people to visit and live in, not only on the coast itself, but inland, um, we're a really diverse community. We are still a largely agricultural community, but we have lots and lots and lots of visitors. Um, we're one of the most popular destinations in California and Sonoma County prides itself on being a pet friendly destination. So when people visit, they bring their pets and uh, we hope that some of our great hospitality resources are listening in tonight and that people pick up some helpful hints just in case they're ever needed. And that happened a few years ago in 2017 when uh, it, it felt like three quarters of the North Bay evacuated in 2017 to the town of Bodega Bay. Over 3,000 people hit this little teeny tiny town escaping the North Bay fires. And uh, this town sprang into action largely because of its multiple preparedness initiatives, uh, chief among them, the Bay Base CERT, and um, another wonderful local organization, Waves of Compassion, or Food Pantry. And they, in true Sonoma County and wine country hospitality fashion, they welcomed all these people and their animals 
uh, to the beaches and uh, the ranch lands and the hotels and the parking lots <laughs> and everybody worked together. And that's really what um, preparedness is about. But we all know we can do it better and we learn every time that we have to. So, okay, I think everybody ready? I think we've kept these early arrivals waiting long enough. Yep, ready. All right. So a bunch of you now heard me give my intro about three times, but uh, for those who just joined us, welcome to Bodega Bay CERT's quarterly community safety meeting. I'm Julie Atwood, and I am a board member and a volunteer with Bodega Bay CERT and a whole bunch of other uh, volunteer disaster service worker organizations. And tonight I'm joined by two fabulous helpers. So on my north in Dundee, Oregon, is my other, um, my, my associate, my ally, my stalwart person, Shiloh Porter. And Shiloh is the silent partner tonight. She's going to be advancing my slides. Um, to my south and east is Mason Enumerable. And Mason is the Grizzly Corps Fellow volunteering or providing his services to a number of our Sonoma County organizations, including Sonoma County Fire Safe Council, Gold Ridge Resource Conservation District and Gold Ridge Fire District. And so Sonoma Fire Safe has graciously given us a hand, lent us a hand tonight by sharing the information about this presentation with lots of its community and sort of volunteering slash loaning Mason to be our moderator. So you will all be muted as soon as you enter. Um, the, con the, uh, our conversation is going to last hopefully a little less than 90 minutes and it's divided into five segments with a little short bonus segment at the end that I'll tell you about. You'll all be muted. However, we will take breaks um, mm, with some frequency probably after every other segment. And you can ask a question during a break by raising your hand and Mason, will unmute you, or anytime you wanna type your question into the chat throughout this conversation, you can. And during our breaks, Mason will capture your questions, ask them, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. So uh, are we ready? Are we ready to go? Okay, let's do it. So tonight's presentation is about animals, emergencies, and disasters. It's really about helping the whole community and the animals. And of course, those of us who understand the enormity and the power of the human animal bond know that animals really are part of the community. So this is a little snapshot right here that gives you just a, a tiny idea. And actually, I think we have some people, I know we have some people joining us from Greenville um, in the aftermath of the Dixie Fire. And you'll see one of your Greenville neighbors there at the local uh, assistance, disaster assistance center. So, okay, take it away to the next slide. Animals, emergencies and disasters, helping the whole community brought to you by Bodega Bay CERT, the Halter Project and Sonoma County Fire Safe. Onward, next slide. The Dega Bay CERT is one of the oldest CERTs in Northern California. For a long time, it was, I think, the only CERT. And we would love to have you join us. You don't have to live full time in Bodega Bay or even on the coast. But if you're interested in getting involved, volunteering, or becoming a board member, take a look at our website, give us an email, and we can also direct you to other CERT organizations around the state, and especially in the North Bay. We have some rock star CERTs and every CERT can use more volunteers. So we'd love to meet you. Thanks, Mason. And next slide. So a lot of you might not wanna stay with me for close to an hour and a half. So just in case, here is what I want you to take away. These three things are at the core of everything I'm going to talk about tonight. You've heard everybody say it, you've heard the PG&E public safety dealers um, have more than one plan. That is at the core of emergency and disaster planning. I always say it's like potato chips, you can't have just one. You need more than one, preferably two or three. So it's just like having contacts in your little black book 
uh, your first plan may go right out the window. Your second plan may not work so well, and you may find yourself falling back on plan C. So always have more than one plan. Understand situational awareness. We are going to circle back to this concept multiple times tonight. What does it mean? It means have your radar at high frequency, have your antenna fully extended, your whiskers are on the ready, and you will be looking up, looking down, and looking all around all the time. Develop that situational awareness as part of your everyday life because it could save your life, your family, your animals at some point. And it's just really handy to keep you from tripping over the dishwasher door when it's down. Last, and in some ways this is the most important, regardless of the situation that you're facing, remember to breathe deeply and stay calm. If you're calm, your animals will be calmer, the people around you will be calmer, and you are going to function better. So another thing that we're going to say repeatedly is that if you're not safe, they're not safe. It's the oxygen mask speech from the, from the airplane. So breathe, stay calm, take care of yourself first so that you can take care of others. Thanks, Mason. Next slide. <clears throat> Part one, launching emergencies and disasters. Hey, guess what? They are not the same. Next slide. So what's the difference between an emergency and disaster? And you might ask, why is this important? Well, next slide will tell you. It's really important to understand the differences. In an emergency, it's gonna be local. It's going to be contained to just you or a few people, a few animals. You're gonna know who to call. The responders are gonna get there quickly. They're gonna take care of everything and the situation is gonna pass quickly. Disaster, not so easy. A disaster is big. It is going to involve a large number of people and usually a much larger area. It could be a whole neighborhood. It could be a city, or as we here in California know all too well, it could be entire chunks of a state at one time. And so why is this important? It's important because how you get help and who provides that help is going to be different in an emergency from a disaster. So we're gonna talk about that next. Next slide. So who responds? Uh, some of these slides have a lot of info. Um, I hope you'll read along. I'm not going to read every single point to you. You get tired of listening to my voice. But in an emergency, you, you could have a, a wide variety of responders, but it's usually going to start with either a first responder who's dispatched through 911 and or somebody you call. It could be someone you call on your phone. It could be yelling over the fence for your next door neighbor. Uh, it's probably going to include your vet because we're talking about the animals. So the resources are going to be local. You're going to be able to use our local emergency dispatch if it's appropriate. And they're probably going to be able to get to you pretty quickly. Uh, the response could actually pretty, be pretty big. It could involve a whole bunch of different people, police, animal control officers. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful search and rescue teams throughout our state and many others. And all these people may end up working together to help get you and your animal or your animal uh, out of a sticky situation. But it happens quickly. It happens without warning, and it's usually over blissfully and blessedly pretty quickly. In a disaster, things are going to be different. For one thing, you're not going to call 911 for help for your animals unless human life safety is at stake. So in an animal disaster, we have a lot of different resources who will ultimately be working together under what's called the incident command system. Now that's also the same for an emergency, but it's just on a much bigger scale. So that means that one agency is going to be responsible for the animals. It usually is the local animal control agency, but sometimes it's a state agency. And the response and the players are going to grow as the incident gets bigger. So it'll start out with our local responders, our local veterinarians, our 
local um, animal disaster volunteers, and then it will get bigger. Um, other counties will offer mutual, will be asked to provide mutual aid, or we might get some state resources. And if it's really big, uh, to that, we get the National Guard, and we might get the USDA and some other big, big, big resources. So it's big, it expands um, as things get bigger and bigger, we'll get more and more resources. As things calm down, some of those resources will deactivate and then we'll go back to our local people. But throughout, everybody is working under one unified command. Next slide. Different types of emergencies and different animal species, which including humans, requires different resources. So um, you might have an injured pet that's gonna involve your veterinarian, maybe a local emergency vet hospital, a friend, a neighbor, bystanders, I mean, things happening at our beaches all the time and in our mountains, uh, dogs um, hurt themselves, sometimes they get too hot and uh, you, you may have to tap into whoever is closest. Um, injured wildlife, that is going to be a call 911 situation or occasionally, sometimes you can call wildlife rescue directly. Again, we're blessed to have a lot of wildlife rescue resources. Don't try to rescue injured wildlife yourself unless you have the authority to do so. Uh, loose and or injured livestock. Something actually happens to us quite a lot in the West, especially in areas where we have open range. So if you encounter um, that kind of situation, you can call 911, or if you happen to know who the animal owner is, you might try to contact them first. Um, big animals like equines or livestock who are trapped, stuck, have fallen over the edge, they're in a transportation accident, or just plain unable to get up. That type of rescue is called animal technical rescue or large animal technical rescue. We have a little segment about that at the very, very end of this, if we have time and if anybody's interested. Um, but in that type of situation, again, you're going to have a variety of responders and they're all going to be working together, hopefully in an integrated fashion. One person's going to be in charge, one person will be the incident commander, and they will be using a variety of technical rescue skills to help that animal. Next slide. So what happens, and this is a common one, when both humans and animals are involved? So these types of emergencies require an integrated response and again, that may include your fire rescue, paramedics, search and rescue, animal control officers, law enforcement officers, hopefully a veterinarian, might need um, heavy rescue team, uh, heavy equipment, or an animal technical rescue team, and you might need animal transport. So when humans and animals are involved, the human life is always going to be priority. And so sometimes the animal rescue team is required to move the animal in order to get to the human first. And one um, really common example of this, usually that has a pretty, you know, pretty, pretty happy outcome, is a horse has slipped and fallen or reared up or spooked at something on a trail, rider falls off. Um, animal slips in the mud, now the animal is on top of the human. And so sometimes the animal just isn't able to scramble up on its own. So we need the rescue team to come and extricate the animal so that the search and rescue team and the paramedics can get the person out safely. But it really takes a village. And in this case, that village is a cadre of skilled and hopefully trained animal technical rescue resources. Okay, next slide. Domestic violence this is really hard to think about and it's really hard to talk about, but we have to because this is an emergency that affects more people than we will ever be aware of. And it really truly is an emergency that impacts animals. So domestic violence situations where pets are endangered occur and they result in people being afraid to leave. So we have people who put themselves at risk by staying in a dangerous home situation because they're afraid of leaving their pet at home with the abuser. What can you do about this? Most importantly, if you know someone 
who might be or is in this situation, find out about local resources and find a way to let them know. You might even offer to you know, foster a pet if it's safe for you to do so, but get in touch with local organizations who provide this kind of support and care. Right here in Sonoma County in the North Bay, we are particularly blessed to have a wonderful, wonderful nonprofit called Ruthless Kindness, who has partnerships with a growing number of organizations that provide uh, safe houses, shelter, and safe transition to families escaping dangerous situations. So if you know somebody in that situation, there are things that you can do about it. And thank you. Next slide. In an animal emergency, how do you request help? Well, depends on the situation. It's too much to go into right here, but we have a resource. We have a great card that you can print out or we can provide it. Oops, I think somebody needs to be muted there. Um, we have this great card. It's available on our website. It takes you step by step through all of the, all of the stages. So how to call for help, who to call for help, depending upon the kind of emergency, and um, some prompts to help you give better information or the best possible information to the call taker. So get in touch with us if you'd like one of these. They're great to have in your glove compartment, in your backpack, in your refrigerator, in your barn. We have lots of resources and we'll give you tips about how to get those throughout this program. Next. In a disaster, now we've been talking about emergencies, now we're switching, okay, in a disaster, who can help? Well, that is going to vary, That's whether, depending upon the stage of the evacuation. So before evacuation is mandatory, meaning before an evacuation order is issued, you can have anybody, just about anybody you like who's gonna be safe. This is when your address book the contacts in your phone and what we call your personal safety network comes into play. These are the people who are gonna be able to come in and help you, whether it's help you get out of the house safely, uh, bring an extra car or drive you or help you load and transport your animals. They are your personal network. And I can't stress enough the importance of developing that network and keeping those contacts handy. Now, once mandatory orders are issued. So that is an evacuation order and what we traditionally think of as mandatory, meaning go now, your life is in danger. Now things change and the only people who are gonna be able to get inside that evacuation zone, that mandatory evacuation zone behind a hard roadblock are authorized animal responders. So really important to know um, who can help you um, during those warning periods and who can help you once your animals or you are inside an evacuation zone and can't get out. Really important. Next slide. In a disaster, uh, how to request help for animals inside an evac zone? Well, again, number one, stay calm, breathe, have a couple of sips of water, staying hydrated is really important because it helps in so many ways. And be ready, be prepared to give the call taker at the other end really good information. So those people are trained. They're going to have a list of questions that are designed to get the best possible information from you about your animals and where they might be so that they can give that information to the animal responders. Now, I am an animal disaster responder. And I have been on the receiving end a bunch of times of really bad information. And I can't tell you how many times we said, oh, we wish we had more detail. We wish we had a better description of the landmarks that would identify this home or which way are we supposed to turn at this three-way intersection? So all kinds of things. So be prepared. That means have everything written down. Have a cheat sheet that you can grab really quickly and keep it with your other important documents. Give accurate details and descriptions of your home and the animal location. Trained responders will be dispatched as soon as possible to help your animals when it's safe. Again, we have a card that gives you the, the Cliff's Notes, sort of a cheat sheet, and it's a, a handy fillable form where you can write down a lot of your emergency contacts. Next slide, please. In a disaster, 
activate your disaster action plan. Now we know all of you listening probably already have a disaster action plan because you're following the Data Base Third and the Halter Project. But you're probably in that, you know, top. 20% who's pretty prepared and you're here because you want to do better. So activate your plan first. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but there are disaster do's and don'ts. So very quickly, do pay attention to alerts, stay calm, get yourself to, uh, I'm sorry, get yourself and other people to safety as soon as possible. Again, that's, that's so important. When you are safe, that's the time to request help for your animals sheltered in place or loose inside the evacuation zones by calling the animal hotlines. And that information will be provided in the emergency alerts. So don't, in a disaster, do not self-deploy to rescue animals. Don't call 911 unless human life safety is at risk. So if human life is at risk, call 911. Um, but if you're calling about the animals, the dispatcher is going to put you on long hold or send you to another resource. So it's better, it's best to have the animal hotline information in your emergency contacts. So if you're safe and you're calling for help for your animals, you're going to call that hotline number. Do not put yourself or others in danger trying to evacuate animals who might be hiding, won't load, or can't load. You're not going to get them. Don't put yourself in danger because if you aren't able to get yourself to safety, you're not gonna be able to call for help for your animals. So leave them, do the things that you can do in those last few minutes or seconds to make them as safe as possible. And we'll go into that later and then get yourself out of Dodge. Next slide. Oh, we're at the end of part one. Does anybody have questions? You can type them into the chat and our cute little fluffy kitten here is reminding you what chat looks like on Zoom. So um, if you don't know how to use chat, you can raise your hand and after part two, Mason will recognize you and you can ask your question. Okay, Mason, next slide. Part two, disaster prep. This is why you're all here, right? But we have to, we have to talk about a number of things in order to help you be as aware as possible of hazards, of the things that can get you, things that go bump in the dark or worse, they might bite or hiss or sting or <laughs> do all kinds of things. So disaster prep includes having a disaster plan. It includes having go kits and stay crates, but it also includes a lot of other things. So right now we're gonna talk about hazard awareness, all hazard awareness. So next slide. Did you know there are two kinds of disasters? Well, if you live here in California, you definitely know that. So there are the disasters that give us lots of heads up. So we have the wonderful National Weather Service and my assistant Shiloh says I'm a National Weather Service groupie. And you know what? It's true and I'm proud of it. And you should be too. Um, a groupie, not proud, not proud that I am. Um, so disasters for which we're gonna get uh, a lot of advanced warning and you know, from some we get more than others. If you live in an area where um, you get big blizzards or ice storms or hurricanes, flooding, you usually get a really uh, long-term warning that's way far out there. It could be three days, it could be weeks. Sometimes it's a couple of weeks. Uh, fire weather, we usually know at least a couple of days in advance that it's heading our way. We might know that we're gonna have a wind event. So. Those are all kinds of incidents for which we have fair warning. We have multiple days and many, many hours to make our final preparations to get ourselves and our animals and our homes ready. And then, then there are the other kinds of disasters, the ones that give us little or no advanced warning. So I live in earthquake country. If you're on the coast, uh, on the entire Pacific coast, anywhere in the world, um, you know about tsunamis and they can happen. And hey, about three weeks ago, we got a big wake up call here in Northern Cal and actually all of the Pacific coast, all the way down to Southern California. We actually got a tsunami warning when we had some big waves and they were caused 
for those of you who don't live here, by an underwater, an undersea, bottom of the ocean volcano, just 50 miles from the island nation of Tonga. I don't remember how many thousands or tens of thousands of miles that is from the Pacific coast of North America, but we experienced the impacts of the tsunami here. We got tsunami alerts. That's almost the first time I've ever seen one. So tsunamis, usually we're gonna get a little bit of a warning. Um, sometimes it might be a little bit more. Earthquakes, not so much. They are working on an early warning system, um, but it's going to be seconds. So if you feel an earthquake here and earthquakes start to happen, uh, you need to do something really fast. And we are all educated from the time, you know, we're about three months old, what to do in an earthquake. Um, it's really important to pay attention to alerts. Alerts are, are your lifeline. And I'm gonna use that term lifeline because we have lots of lifelines, but often we don't use them or we don't know how to use them. So know how to get alerts. There are lots of different ways to get alerts. And this program isn't really going to go into that, but we will tell you where to go to get that information. So next slide. So how to prepare for almost everything. You know, we're never gonna be 100% perfect. We just do the best we can. And this part of our presentation is about being situationally aware and looking up, looking down, looking all around, listening, using all our senses and our powers of observation to find out and kind of stash away the information about things that could hurt us, not just in everyday life, but in any type of situation we might encounter. So if you live here in California, a lot of the time that's gonna be um, a wind event, fire weather, could be a really bad storm on the coast. It could involve flooding. If you live, especially in a, a river area or near a big reservoir where a dam could possibly fail. Uh, if you live in other parts of the country, you've got big storms, you have tornadoes that you learn how to prepare for hurricanes, ice storms, snowstorms. So there are ways to prepare for everything. They're going to improve the odds for you and your animals. And that's really what we're talking about. So be prepared for everything that could happen wherever you and your animals might be. That's at home, at work, in your neighborhood, identify and be aware of all possible hazards. And then make a plan for everything that could possibly endanger you or your animals. Next slide. Make a disaster action plan. We like acronyms in this business, so a DAP for every possibility and get to know, get really cozy with those alerts that can pop up on your TV screen, on your phone, in an emergency alert that um, are issued by FEMA, by the National Weather Service, by your local emergency services agencies. These little icons are the um, universal symbols. Now there, there are multiples for just about every incident, but they are all pretty consistent. So know what those are and what, what they mean. If we had more time, we'd ask you to take a test and connect the icon to its word, but we'll just let you maybe take a screenshot and do that in your own time. So get to know those alerts and be familiar with how to get them and make a plan for what to do if one or more of those could happen to you. Next slide. Know your zone. Okay, well, here in uh, California, and I know we have some people from Colorado with us and probably a few other places. Know your zone is a term we have become really familiar with in the last couple of years. And that means your evacuation zone. Now for quite a while, uh, evacuation zones have been fluid. They've been dynamic. They change from incident to incident. That's become problematic and emergency managers uh, have decided at least here in our state and a lot of other places, that the time has come to make evacuation zones uh, uh, consistent. So in other words, they're not gonna change from emerge from disaster to, to disaster. So know your zone wherever you are. And I cannot stress that enough. That means at work, at school, where your kids are, at the doctor, and on vacation. Now, 
I preach this to people all the time. And last summer, I got on a soapbox and I, pub I wrote and published a series of articles that were aimed at the hospitality industry, um, owners of um, Airbnbs, VRBOs, hotels, resorts, campgrounds, about the importance, especially in places that are pet friendly and encourage people to come and camp or stay with their pets or ride with uh, their equines. The importance of helping those visitors who are transient residents understand what to do, where to go, how to get help, how to stay safe in a disaster. So uh, I wrote those articles in June and July and August. At the end of August through most of September, I found myself up in Plumas County responding to the Dixie Fire. I was there for close to six weeks. And um, I and my teammates with the UC Davis Veterinary Emergency Response Team had to house surf. We were really lucky to have um, a whole variety of comfortable VRBOs to stay in, but we could never stay in one for more than two, three or four days because it was also a very busy time of year where these houses were. And so not one, not two, but three times I found myself in a VRBO that was suddenly under either an evacuation warning or went immediately to an evacuation order. And in one case, I actually knew the zone I was in, but in the other two, I didn't because the agency or the company that handled the property management did not make that information available. And actually called a woman up and said, hey, I am in uh, this house, um, Greenville, or uh, um, um, well, I won't tell you the name, but I'm in this house, this is my address. And I just got the uh, mandatory evacuation alert. And up there, everybody in the entire county gets a wireless emergency alert. So those of you who've heard those, you can imagine what's that, what that's like when a whole neighborhood gets it at once or you're inside Safeway and everybody gets the alert at one time. I experienced that, <laughs> you'll never forget it. And so I asked the property management firm, um, I'm, at, I'm at this address, what evacuation zone am I in? And she said to me, oh, we just got it too and we don't know. So I noticed that about a week and a half later, they published a really, really great um, uh, info sheet for all people staying in houses managed by their firms. So wake up call for everybody. But uh, I knew enough to just grab all my, my clothes or everything in the car and get ourselves out of there as quickly as possible. So know your zone and um, here in Sonoma County, we actually have the link down there. And of course, all this information is available in multiple languages. Here we're showing Spanish and English. So next slide. What else could happen? Okay, this is the million dollar question. What are all possible hazards and what could possibly happen? Well, um, aid and rescue resources might be unable to reach you for days, possibly weeks. Communications are limited, they might be non-existent. Um, your home and other structures might be unsafe or inaccessible. You could be outside when it happens and now you can't get to it, you can't get to your animals. You might be alone or you might be hurt. Very good chance you're not gonna have any power or safe drinking water, especially if you're on a city system. It's important when you're thinking about these things to have a discussion not now, I mean now, not later, not later. Have this discussion now before you need it with your veterinarians about prescriptions, comfort care, and how emergency euthanasia might be administered. We don't like thinking about these things. I don't like having to make people think about them, but you know what? It's a lot better to think about it now and plan for it now and have a plan than to be faced with this in the moment. And uh, I, I can tell you firsthand that that is just so true. So what else could happen? Next slide. Well, you could be evacuating with your animals in the pandemic. Uh, back in March of 2020, I attended a Red Cross training where we had a tabletop exercise about this what if. And the Red Cross workers there who um, had just deployed to or come from a big tornado cluster in the Midwest, uh, we're talking about the fact that suddenly this was uh, becoming something to really worry about. Well, none of us knew how just how relevant this was going to be. Uh, we got into the summer, things started happening. 
and uh, deploying, or I'm, I'm sorry, responding and um, evacuating in a pandemic suddenly became a real thing. So we started pushing out a lot of information to help people prepare for that. And this is just one of the pieces. We ran this as an ad in a lot of local publications and social media, and we also made it available to just about anybody who asked. So you can get that too. Hopefully that's gonna go away, but right now we're, we're still looking at that. And there are a lot of things that you need to take into consideration when you are evacuating with your animals, especially your pets in the middle of a, a pandemic or an epidemic. Next slide. So part of the plan is having go bags and stay crates. They are your survival kits. Um, they include all of the life and health safety essentials and goodies for comfort and enrichment. So goodies are really important for your kids, for yourself, and for your animals because they may be cooped up for a long time. You need to keep them comfortable, happy, and entertained. Okay, so important to think about. Go bags are what you have ready for an evacuation. Your stay crates are the emergency supplies that are packed and ready to go or ready to stay with you when you can't leave safely. Next slide. Your personal safety net. Wow, Mr. Rogers, what does that picture say to you? It's all about the neighborhood, right? So we all need Mr. Rogers with us. So he can't be with us, but his words sure can. And it's, it's all about knowing your neighbors and helping one another, being kind, being aware, reaching out, knowing who around you might need help for themselves and especially with their animals. So these are the people of, these are the people who are going to be able to help you in an evacuation situation with the actual evacuation, with transportation, and possibly with shelter. They might be able to keep your animals for you for a while or maybe take you and your animals. So who will help you with your animals? These are all important questions. Where will you go? How will you get there? Are your contacts up to date? Really important, you can't call for help if the number is out of date. Is your contact info accessible in different formats? Don't rely on your phone, don't rely on your computer, don't rely on just your address book. Have all three or even more. Have a list on your refrigerator, your medicine cabinet. Do you have resources who will help your animals if you're not home? Again, it's that thing that we all hate to think about, but there is a really good chance that's going to happen. So having people in your neighborhood, having Mr. Rogers and his friends and associates lined up to help you is really important. Next slide. Are your animals on the same page? Okay, you can be ready. You can have a plan. You can have everything packed and ready to go. How about your animals? Uh, are they trained? Are they ready? Are they prepared? So this requires homework, requires work, and it can be really fun. You need to practice loading your animals, whether they're little or big in different conditions. Don't just do it in the daytime on a nice sunny day. Do it at night, do it during a storm. Um, and get different people to load them. That's really important. They may do it perfectly for you, but they may look askance at your helper. I have a mule and I have cats. I know this all too well. Uh, practice putting on and walking with harnesses um, and leashes. So harnesses can be tricky, especially if you're nervous, if you're excited, if your hands are shaking, especially getting harnesses on cats. I love cat harnesses. They are a really great way to keep cats safer, especially if uh, your cat freaks out in a carrier, but they are a little trickier to get on. So practice, practice, practice. I actually have one cat who thinks that his harness is like a thunder shirt. It really calms him down. He loves it. He loves walking on it. So make sure that your animals are comfortable with the way that you're going to move them and make sure they're comfy with your emergency helpers. Next slide. More awareness. So awareness of hazards. Hazards are everywhere. They're everywhere in our lives. You know, the old adage is that most accidents happen at home. And it's true. You tripped taking out the garbage. You tripped over the door to the dishwasher when it was down. So you, you fell down the stairs. 
things happen. So it's easy enough to find hazards in your everyday life. So imagine what might be around you in an emergency or disaster. So they fall loosely into two categories, the things you can see, uh, and some of the really big ones, the really important ones are electricity, down and live wires. Um, do you know that water and smoke can conduct electricity very effectively? So don't go anywhere where you see any kind of down wire, whether you think it's deactivated or not. You don't know, the fire service doesn't know, the only resource that knows is gonna be the utility company. And they are there checking on this and deactivating, de-energizing these wires so that our other first responders can move about the area safely. And our firefighters, our LEOs, they do not go anywhere until they have the go ahead, the all clear from the utility companies. Uh, fuel tanks, including propane and natural gas, as well as vehicle fuel on a lot of our farms and ranches. Toxic materials. How many of you know what is toxic under your kitchen sink or in your garden shed? So each of those things, those bottles and jars and boxes might be totally safe on its own, but what happens in an earthquake or a flood if suddenly they all mix together? Something like chlorine bleach can become extremely dangerous and volatile if it's mixed with something else. So it's really important to understand how to store all those things safely and to look for them uh, in the environment after a really disruptive incident. And again, that could be um, flood, it could be an earthquake, it can also be a fire. Fire really moves a lot of stuff around and uh, you really don't want to expose yourself to that. If your animals are exposed to it, it's really good to know what you can do to mitigate those harmful effects. Uh, garden, household products, paints, motor oil, brake fluid, chlorine bleach, detergents, just all kinds of things can turn toxic when they're out there on the loose and spilled in your personal environment. Pressurized tanks. Again, we live in a rural area where a lot of people have shops, um, and this could also include oxygen. So if you have a welding shop nearby or you do this kind of thing on your property, those can become giant explosive devices that can launch um, hundreds of feet. Trees, big hazard, and most of us know that. Structures, your structure, your home, your barn, your shed, um, it could be very unstable. You might not see visible damage. That doesn't mean it's safe. So learn, um, learn the danger signs, learn to assess the structures around you and know what the danger signs are and don't go in, don't go near. Uh, chimneys and masonry walls, again, you may not see the damage, but that doesn't mean they couldn't come tumbling down at any time. In 2014, when we had the South Napa earthquake, the greatest amount of damage was uh, done by masonry because Napa and Sonoma, and Vallejo, the areas that were hardest hit, are old towns and they have a lot of masonry buildings some of them reinforced, some of them not, and a number of people were injured, fortunately, not seriously, not too seriously, and I don't recall that um, anybody died, but there were some pretty serious injuries as a result of people being hit, caught by falling masonry. Metal, glass, and sharp objects are going to be all around. Um, next slide. So those are some of the hazards you can see, but there are loads of hidden hazards, things you cannot see, um, septic tanks and wells, burning stumps and ash pits. You really don't want to walk in those. Um, burned electric vehicle batteries, snakes and insects. They come out of the woodwork in floods and fires. Underwater objects, fences, wire, uh, just about anything. Again, um, don't walk into water where you can't see the bottom at all, period, for any reason. Um, unstable ground, mud, quicksand, a lot of these can trap animals and the people who go in to try to rescue them, and it quickly becomes a really bad situation. Contaminated water, again, don't walk into flood water, it's full of stuff you do not want on your skin. Poison oak and ivy, this could be by direct contact or through smoke. 
um, one of the primary firefighter injuries is inhalation of poison oak smoke, toxic air in general. And we all know a lot more now about monitoring air quality. It's really important to keep that in mind. Get an app that will help you stay on top of the air quality where you are. Next slide. Hazard awareness, making things safer for you and your animals. So this means that you have followed the steps um, that we've outlined in the last few minutes. You are much more situationally aware. You've looked for all those hazards. You've thought about what's the worst that could happen. And now you're gonna prepare for the safest spaces in a fire, flood, wind, storm, quake, slight tsunami for your animals. So you're gonna make your animal homes as safe as possible just as you do your own home. Are your resources safe? And this means your power, your water, your food, your medicines, your tools, and your supplies. You might be safe, but could a tree come crushing down on the shed or the trailer uh, where your supplies are stored? You really need to think about that. Farmers and ranchers, can you protect your business, particularly if you have a certified organic business? So that's a whole other, uh, um, can of worms, and we're not going to go into those details tonight, but we are asking the question because it's important. Can responders find and get into your property? Uh, it sounds like a no-brainer, but you know what? If you talk to a firefighter or sheriff's deputy, they're going to tell you this is their biggest challenge and the thing that wastes the greatest amount of life-saving time when evacuations are occurring. Make your home easy to see, easy to find in the worst of circumstances. Will your tools and supplies be safe and accessible? Again, make sure that they're not gonna get smashed, swept away, or that you are going to be prevented from getting to them. Next slide. Uh, just a little wake me up. So just a couple of snapshots of the kinds of supplies. Um, these are all mine. Uh, those pictures on the top are what my supplies looked like when I laid them all out on the floor of my barn. They all came out of two vehicles and I was able to work out of my barn while we were um, sheltered in place because we had no option. And all that stuff kept me, uh, the others on the ranch and my animals safe. And overall, it kept us pretty healthy. The animals ate way better than I did. I'll tell you that uh, good horse cookies taste a lot better than stale power bars. Next slide. Property access checklist. Okay, these are just a few. Make sure you have two-sided reflective address signs. Make sure that you have emergency vehicle clearance. You can talk to your local fire department or take a look at the CAL FIRE Ready for Wildfire app to get this information, which does very little from place to place. Make sure that your bridge can hold an emergency vehicle safely, because if it can't, fire service isn't gonna go there. Uh, have directional signs. If you live in a place with a lot of homes on the same property or access from one driveway or road, and make sure that your electric gates are disabled when you leave. Next slide. What about the disasters that happen with just seconds, minutes, or no warning? Okay, so we've spent the last 10 minutes talking about the, the disasters that give us a heads up. Now we're going to spend some time looking at the ones that don't. Next slide. Of course, most of the time this means an earthquake or tsunami because in most places, um, tornado warnings are pretty good. Um, you, know, you don't have a lot of time, but usually people have enough time to get themselves and their animals to a place of safety. Um, but an earthquake, we're going to have uh, practically no warning or no warning at all. Um, we may have only seconds or minutes for a tsunami. Help may not reach us for hours, possibly days. Communications are probably going to be totally knocked out or overloaded. Your home or property could very well be inaccessible by road for a long, long time. So breathe stay hydrated, stay situationally aware so that you are safe and you can help everybody else around you. Next slide. How do you prepare for something like that? Well, we've talked a lot about general preparation and that's gonna help you just staying calm, being able to regulate uh, your breathing and your heart rate is gonna 
to help you stay focused and think more clearly. And that alone is going to go a long way toward keeping you safer and more aware of your surroundings. Know what to do in a quake. Um, now it means drop cover and hold on. Drop cover and hold on. Those of us of a certain age, we learned it differently. Uh, they've changed it a little bit, but drop cover, hold on. When the shaking stops, now is the time that you can come out, uh, be ready for aftershocks, but you know, maybe find, find your animal. It's probably just as share, scared as you are and probably is hiding under something. Um, know where and how to leave, so how to escape safely. Make your animal homes as safe as possible. Again, this is planning, looking around, look up, look down, look all around before a disaster happens. You might, if you have large animals, take some time to attend some trainings in animal technical rescue, because if you're alone and, uh, or you're, you're in a place where your neighbor, or you might have an animal trapped uh, in a place that you can actually get to safely, this might come in handy. And again, I stress access safely. That's always gonna be the key. Don't put yourself at risk to try to rescue an animal. You're not going to do anybody or the animal any good. Next slide. How can I help my animals after the initial disaster? Before you approach, so you're back, you're assessing the situation, you are not going near them until you've looked around at the environment for all possible hazards. So these could include um, hazmat spills, leaks, leaning trees, structure damage, unstable ground debris, all the things we've talked about and more. It's that situational awareness. Assess your animals for injury. You might have to do this at a distance. Hopefully you can get up close enough to do it safely. Provide them with clean water, light feed, stabilize the injury if you're able to, take their temperatures if you can, and keep them hydrated. If you're prepared, you might provide pain medication or pain management. And again, you need to discuss this with your vet. Next slide. Who respond? I'm sorry, that was a different slide. <laughs> Help your responders find you. Again, this is always an issue. And uh, in this type of situation where roads are probably gonna be totally out of commission, uh, you need to be creative and you need to have supplies on hand and resources that you are aware of and connected to to help you let responders know where you are. So again, there's likely to be widespread communication system failure. So who could be your biggest helper? Your local ham radio operators. Uh, we are really, really fortunate in our coastal areas and a number of other areas around our county to have some absolute rock star amateur radio clubs. Um, they are all, many of them are all part of our auxiliary communication service, which works hand in hand with our Department of Emergency Management during disasters. So they are giving immediate boots on the ground intelligence to our first responders. And often they are going to be the only link between you in your neighborhood or where you live and help from the outside world. If you have limited bandwidth, sometimes you might, you can also try texting to an out of area friend. And that's really important uh, um, aspect of your, uh, sorry, my little alarm went off to remind me of what time it is. So out of area contacts are very, very important part of your safety network because you may not be able to reach somebody next door or in the next town, but you might be able to reach somebody in the next state. So really important to make sure that your network includes resources who are further away. Your area might be extremely unstable and impassable. So you need to have materials in, from which you can make yourself visible from the air. So um, think about rocks, spray paint, of flares, if it's safe to use a flare, meaning there's, there's no danger of fire, um, all kinds of reflective materials. So safety blankets, insulated blankets, have a cache of material available that you can set out so that responders who are doing reconnaissance and making um, supply drops from the air can see you. Next slide. 
Okay, last but not least for this section, resources. There are actually some really cool resources for earthquakes and tsunamis, and they're interesting and actually fun to spend some time with. So I love these. 